My name is Dewey Wendell Barnhill, and I was raised in Loxley, and I'd like to share a story with you that my mother shared with me in 1985, a short time before she passed. And uh, it was somewhat like this. I said, Mama, please tell me how you all wound up in Loxley in Baldwin County. She said, well, son, she said, I was not happy living in Leland, Louisiana, a real outback town with no conveniences. We, we had to go uh, 30 miles to town, to Alexandra, and she said, I just told Daddy, said, Diff, I'm really not happy here. I would like to go back home. So she had two children, ages three and ages one. And so he said, you just do that. You go back to Loxley and you find us a place to live and I'll wind this business down and I'll join you and we'll go there and we'll lease some land and we'll build a turpentine still there and we'll build our business there. So uh, although I didn't know my dad because he died when I was a year and four months old, I always treasure the stories that uh, everyone told about him because they said he was a, <clears throat> a righteous guy and easy going and easy to get along with and had a lot of employees that loved him. And I always liked those stories. So anyway, mother got on the train there and Lena on our property, the train went through our property, which I own now, 31 acres. And I'm sure dad must have leased other property because you couldn't make a living on 31 acres of turpentine, <coughs> longleaf pines. But anyway, mom came on the train, she came with Roger and Hazel, the two children, and she told the story about winding up in Stapleton, Alabama, and the train stopped to take on some water. And then she said the conductor came back there and said, I need you all to help me. We've got to have pine knots to get to Loxley. So she got out with the two children and other people got out and off of that L N uh, railroad and they gathered up pine knots and came on to Loxley. So that, that's the way we wound up in Loxley. And Dad purchased 40 acres there and he also built a turpentine still. And so Dad was building his business and doing quite well, but he died suddenly in 34 with uh, complications with the heart and diabetes and so forth. And my brother Roger, who was a principal at Rosenton at the time, uh, mother engaged him and said, Roger, would you please come along and, and take care of the family business because she had all these children. I was the youngest of nine children and all of us, all of us were, were children except for two adults. My oldest sister was 23 when I was born, so Roger was always our hero. He came along <laughs> beside Mama and they built that business and they did real well with it. And then World War II came along and two of my brothers just older than me was called off to the war. But I want to share some experiences before World War II and particularly during the uh, late 30s during the Depression. I was born in 34, so times were tough. There wasn't, there wasn't a lot of money and there wasn't a lot of things going on in, in Loxley, Alabama. Uh, most of us who, ha who could afford it had a cow for milk. We had chickens for chicken. We had chickens for eggs and for meat. We had hogs for meat. We had cattle for meat. So we were blessed. Mother raised a big garden and she would can, seemed like she canned all summer long. She'd work us to death in those gardens. But anyway, it was a good life and we were a big family. We lived right in Loxley in town. It was no, no stock law, so there was cattle up and down the roads, no paved roads, they were everywhere. And ironically, we had about four uh, grocery stores in Loxley at that time. You would think, man, that's a lot of stores for a little town, but they were very small stores, and you would go to the store and you'd go with a list, and you would give the list to the merchant, and they would go pick the merchandise off the shelves. And, and uh, prepare it for you and ring it up. Most of us had charge accounts. I never will forget one Christmas when I was a little tyke, about six years old, my mother had uh, a lot of different dishes and none of them matched. So I went around to the grocery store and, uh, and I picked out her uh, uh, some dishes. 
And uh, so the lady said, how are you going to pay for it? I said, just charge them. So I, I got them all wrapped up and put them under the Christmas tree for mom. And mom opened those dishes up. She said, son, how do you pay for these dishes? I said, Mama, I just charged them. She got the biggest kick out of that. She said, <laughs> I'll never forget my mom. She was, she was quite a trooper. But anyway, uh, some of those times during the 30s were tough. Mama had a, Daddy had uh, a, what we call a commissary behind our house there on the block in Locksley, and he kept uh, certain foods there for his help during that time. He kept rice and he kept uh, salt meat and he kept hams and he kept things that, uh, that you didn't have to refrigerate or like meal and and so forth and so on, tobacco for, for the men and so forth. But anyway, uh, I never will forget about 1939, the WPA came along and they were going to have a display up north of Loxley where I-10 is now and there was nothing up there then but woods, but the, uh, they set up a t the government set up a tent up there and gave a demonstration on an automatic milker for cattle. And of course, we everybody was milking the cattle in by hand and up into the 40s, but I never will forget Mama loaded us all up in a pickup truck. We went up there and she said, boys, I don't think we could ever have one of those. I think, I think those cows would bleed in the milk. But, that's another story. Now they do it all digitally and you don't have to touch a cow. They clean the cows and everything. So I was raised on a, on a farm there in Loxley. So uh, when the turpentine business began to go down in the, in the 50s, uh, my brothers turned to farming and uh, they were very successful farmers. They Roger and Charles. They were farming and then of course Maston came back from World War II and David came back from World War II. And those were interesting years. I never will forget we'd have blackout periods at night where we would have mock air raids and everybody, we were all sort of paranoid about World War II. We were concerned about uh, the Germans uh, invading us at Gulf Shores. We were concerned about the Japanese uh, invading us on the, from the Pacific and because there was, there was a number of ships that was blown up, uh, was a, the shipping lanes, the merchant marines would, would uh, ship out of New Orleans and Houston and so forth and down toward Miami and all over the world and carrying supplies to our troops in Germany and the German submarines would just blow those ships up and we'd hear about it, we'd, we'd get in, We'd get us a ride and go down to Orange Beach or, and Gulf Shores and see these tremendous things, uh, things that had blown up in the ship coming up on the shores. And early on in the war, the, Ge the Germans would uh, come up and they'd give the boys a chance to get off those ships. And one of my good friends who became a mentor to me, Jack Cooper, was a merchant marine shipping out of Mobile. And he said at one night they were 50 miles off of Gulf Shores and a German submarine came up and the captain spoke in English, abandoned the ship, we're going to blow the ship up. But during the later end of the war, they didn't give them an opportunity to abandon the ship, they blew them up. So uh, another thing that I remember vividly about World War II is my mother going to the post office every morning with those two boys in the war effort. And if she didn't, she didn't get a letter, she came back with tears in her eyes. And there were so many of our boys in Baldwin County that went to World War II and never came back. So it was a time in church every Sunday that was special prayer for those boys. And uh, fortunately, both of my brothers made it through the war and they came back and they were successful farmers and successful businessmen and so forth. Then I moved on to uh, going to school in Loxley during the early 40s. Um, we uh, were able to walk to school. That was a good thing. We could walk home for our meals and mother always had three good meals a day for us. We worked on the farm and went to school there. We went to high school, of course, in Robertsdale. So all of my brothers went to junior high school in Loxley and of course my two older uh, 
brothers and sisters, they went to normal school in Daphne, which is the Nicholson Center now, and they both got uh, education there and education. So they both, my oldest sister, Hazel, she spent 40 years in the Baldwin County school system. And my brother, Roger, of course, his, his uh, occupation in teaching came short. When daddy passed, he came home to run the business and uh, we'll always be grateful to him for that. And so we move on now through Loxley and raising up on the farm there. We had quite a farm and the Cordes and Bertolas and the Ligres and the Grimes, they had shipping sheds in Loxley and they would hire hundreds of people during the summer. Uh, the Cordes and Bertolas and, and my family were both uh, Raisers and shippers of corn, soybeans, Irish potatoes, sweet potatoes, cucumbers, whatever it took that they could market on the northern markets. And I was told at one time that the Cordes would ship 100 carloads of Irish potatoes out of Baldwin County a day. And that's quite, a, that's quite an accomplishment. Those guys, the Italian families came here, the Cordes, the Bertolas, the Ligres, and, and the, the Flippies, and whoever, they all came here and they were good farmers, they worked really hard, and they set a good example for people. And uh, we always admired them and respected them for their ability to run their businesses and they, they did a great job and provided a great opportunity for many people to work during the summer. And then during the war years, I worked on the shed. I never will forget uh, Mr. Teal Cordy. Uh, I was out playing under a tree one morning, about nine years old, and mother was sweeping the porch. We, we were raised one block from those shipping sheds, and he came along and he said, Miss Barnhill, can I hire your son to go to work? She said, put him to work, <laughs> put that boy to work. So he put me up on, he had the first machine that would wash potatoes in Baldwin County, and it was built out of plywood. And uh, he put me on top of that machine because it was, uh, it was uh, clogging up, and so, it, my, my job was to keep the potatoes rolling and, and keep them going through there. So uh, I worked for a week and I was anxious to get that check. I never will forget, I, made, I think I made $13. And also we were working at that time, we had a prison camp north of Loxley. And we was always concerned about the prisoners breaking away, but I never heard of any of them uh, breaking out and going. And we mother during the time of World War II, she rented, the, the housing was very, very uh, limited in Loxley, Alabama and Baldwin County as a whole because people came from Escambia County, Connecticut County, Wilcox County. They came everywhere here to work in the war effort. And uh, in Mobile, you could go over uh, where, the, where the bridge is now you could go up to what we call Bridgeport then, which is Spanish Fort now on that hill and just look across Mobile Bay and it was just solid welding uh, effort at night. They were turning out ships over there, warships just constantly, uh, merchant marine ships and so forth for cargo. And so our transportation back then was uh, mostly by, this, by the Greyhound bus and by the uh, trains. So when you need to leave town to go anywhere uh, out of town for any distance, we went train or we went to, with the Greyhound bus. And uh, even after, uh, even after the war effort, that was pretty much it because cars were not available during World War II. All that switched over to the war effort, and the Fords and. General Motors and all that, they, they were building tanks and airplanes and everything else for the war effort. So my brother came home from college in 1940 from Auburn. By the way, we got 33, 33 and three to four generations in my family that graduated from Auburn and we have about 15 or 16 that graduated from Bama. Needless to say, we have a lot of fun during football season. We all love each other and kid each other about it. We look forward to it every year. So that's our story. My, my brother David started that uh, in 1937. He went to Auburn and worked his way through there. 
And uh, he was an encouragement to all of us that uh, wanted to go ahead and all of us that did. All of us got a college education, but the two boys that didn't, they went to Auburn right after World War II and the housing was critical. There was nothing available to rent to speak of. They found an old, base, old basement around there and they said, we're not going to live in a basement. We're coming home and farm. Well, it was a good decision for them because they did really well. They uh, accumulated properties and they raised successful families and raised their families in, in the Christian atmosphere and did a great job with their families, those two boys. I'm really proud of all my family because they all worked hard and did well. This is my lovely wife, Charlotte. We've been married 66 years. We met the first year, met the very first time in the first day of 11th grade. I was sitting somewhat at a distance behind her and I looked up and she looked back and smiled and boy, that smile turned me on. I took off up there and there was an empty chair behind her and I knew I had to take math and it was going to be tough. So I asked her, Charlotte, how do you do in math? She said, I make A's. So I said, would you help me with my math? She said, I will indeed. Boy, I knew I was on there. <laughs> so I asked her for a date. We had our first date two weeks from then. I asked her for the second date and her mother wouldn't let me go and I was just about devastated because I was in love with that girl already. But she's been a wonderful wife and wonderful mother and a helpmate all these years. She stuck by me through thick and thin, through many businesses, some up, some down. Thank God for my wife, Charlotte. She's been such a blessing to me and my family. <clears throat> well, he's been a wonderful husband, and he was. it's been worth sticking with him through thick and thin. <laughs> We've had it ups and downs, but many a good year. <laughs> we have one son, one son, Alan, Wendell Allen Barnhill, who has been a delight so it's never been a disappointment in our life. He's 61 years old, and we love him so much that words can't express it. And we have two grandchildren, one daughter, one granddaughter. She works in New York, and one uh, grandson who works from home. I'd like to reminisce about World War II again. Uh, it, was a, it was a particular time in my life because I had two brothers that was involved in that war effort. One, uh, one fighting the Japanese and one in Europe. He was a foot soldier. And my other brother was intelligence in, in the Aleutian Islands in regard to fighting the Japanese. He was an interpreter and he would uh, identify targets and he would uh, send the planes out to bomb certain targets. But anyway, getting back to Loxley during World War II, everything was rationed. Meat was rationed, sugar was rationed, candy was rationed, uh, just about everything was rationed and we had uh, coupons published by the government that would allow us to get a certain amount of sugar, a certain amount of this, a certain amount of that. So we had to be really particular and rational things that we had. And then uh, in regard to the Japanese and the, and the Germans, the, the, I often, my friends don't quite, my older, my younger friends don't quite understand why they, the Germans were called Krauts and the Japanese were called Japs. But I tell you, our boys were over there fighting for their lives and fighting for our lives because we weren't sure that we, we weren't going to be taken out in that war. And so there wasn't a lot of friendship developed between us. And one day uh, in about 1941, we had a big old uh, Gruen, I think it's a Gruen radio and I came in the room and this fellow was just ranting on there and ranting on there in a different language and I asked my brother Ben who I was very close to he was five years older than me I said Ben what in the world is that he said that's old Hitler he thinks he's going to conquer the world well old Hitler thought he was going to conquer the world but it didn't happen our boys sacrificed and, and uh, kept us from being uh, under that uh, dominion but anyway 
And so during World War II, you could not go out anywhere in Baldwin County 24 hours a day without hearing planes dogfighting. They came from Barrenfield, they came from Mainside and, and Pensacola. And my brother-in-law, Wade Rock, was a fighter pilot trainer at that time. And he was training out of Barrenfield and he was training these. And we, we often had, these boys would run into each other and you'd see them jump out of parachutes. And unfortunately, a number of them got killed but uh, it was not uncommon for me to hear a pop in the air and you look up and boys would be jumping out in parachutes and sometimes they perished and sometimes they didn't. But one particular instance I remember, we was up on the farm one day and I heard a pop in the collision and I look up and there's one man coming down in a parachute and so we go and we get him and we bring him home before the Navy gets there and he's all concerned about his uh, student that he was training because he didn't know whether he made it or not. And the student, unfortunately, he, he never could get his parachute open. So my brother Ben and I was looking for him out in a cornfield out there and my brother Ben found him first. And he said, Wendell, you don't need to go see that. And I said, tell me about it. He said, well, this man had just he had his coat on over his chute where he was going to pull the string and he couldn't reach it and he just clawed it, clawed that leather jacket. It was a real cold day. And so anyway, that's memories that stick in my mind about World War II. And then we had a sergeant that lived at our house during that time. Uh, mother rented the top of our house out because our boys were gone off to the war. and. So anyway, uh, we had a first sergeant there that was really in charge of the prison camp north of Loxley. And he said that we had better food for our German prisoners there than, uh, than, than uh, people could buy over the counter in Loxley, Alabama. He said they had steaks every week and they, tr they treated them and really well. And, uh, and uh, we didn't have a situation like my nephew not my nephew, but my first cousin, who was in a German prison camp in Germany, who gave his wedding ring for one little piece of toast one day to a, to a, to a German soldier. And he came home almost starved to death. He was a strong, strapping man, and he was captured in uh, North Africa. With the, he was a uh, he was Auburn graduate, and he was also uh, a tank commander, but he was captured there and was in the prison camp for the duration of the war. And I couldn't believe, I hardly knew who he was when he came home. He was so thin, I think he weighed 80 pounds. He probably went to war weighing 225 or whatever. But anyway, World War II was a, a time to remember. And I wish today that uh, we had the respect for those boys that. Uh, spent their time and efforts to protect us in that war effort. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't understand that. And Mr. Jimmy Grimes was a character in Loxley. Mr. Jimmy Grimes, I was a little old boy running around there during World War II, barefoot and pair of overalls on. I walked into his office one day and I said, Mr. Jimmy, what is that on your desk? He said, son, that's a Jap ear. I said, what in the world are you doing with a Jap ear, Mr. Jimmy? He said, well, he told, he said, I told one of my friends in the Marines, when you get over there, you send me a Jap ear. And that was a Jap ear pickled and right there on it. So I'll move on. That's enough of World War II. I'll tell you about my grammar school uh, years in Loxley. It was a wonderful time to grow up in Loxley because you know, we didn't know what crime was, except uh, we did have people stealing the chickens because things, and they would steal tires. I never will forget my mama one, one night during the moonlight night, she saw some boys out there stealing their chickens. They were hungry. Mama rolled that window up and she said, we didn't, we didn't have air conditioning or fans or anything back there. Mama, Mama said, son, get out of my chicken yard out there. <laughs> Leave my chickens alone. And one night we had a guy came up there and trying to steal the tires off the school bus that my brother uh, drove and uh, she ran them off too. So 
she was she was something else about that. But she she controlled that situation around there real well. Then we had uh, a neighbor that owned the uh, hotel one block from our house. We all had cows, and we had an old cow named Belle. And Miss Stapleton, she'd go off and buy her, uh, she'd buy her some feed for old Belle, and she'd put it in a Plymouth pickup, and she'd leave it, uh, she'd leave it uh, back of that, back of the car. It wasn't a pickup; it was Plymouth car. And old Belle go around and they'd jerk that stuff out. <laughs> she'd pull it out and he'd, boy, after a while you'd hear a pistol go off. <laughs> Miss Staple would shoot that pistol up there and run old Bill off. But anyway, Miss Staple was visiting our house one night. Back then, these ladies would visit each other. We didn't have TVs, we had a radio. And their entertainment then in the summertime was come shell peas and help each other. And uh, so anyway, my mother was I was in the living room, Mrs. Stapleton came down, she ran the hotel, and we had an old dog named Nellie that would suck eggs. And so, you know, Nellie, like everybody else's dog, they just ran free all over the neighborhood. She was a wonderful hunting dog. But anyway, we were sitting in the living room one night, and, uh, and we had a crisis to happen. So the next night, Mrs. Stapleton and her Daughter Cherie, little daughter five years old, was visiting us. And Mama said, I had the strangest thing to happen to me last night. Said, my old dog Nellie, I felt, I heard her fall out on the porch. Somebody had poisoned her. And I never will forget Mama. She said, get me a dozen eggs immediately. And she took those dozen eggs and she forced them down old Nellie's neck and uh, down her throat and saved her. But anyway, what happened when Mother shared that story, Mrs. Stapleton's little daughter, daughter Cherie, she looked around at her mama and she said, Mama, didn't you say that was Miss Barnhill's bird dog that you poisoned last night? <laughs> I'll never forget that story and I love to share it. And then I want to tell you about my school years in Loxley again. We could go home for, for lunch and so forth and so on. I had some wonderful teachers. And back then, mamas and daddies didn't take you to school. My brother Ben took me to school, and he walked in the front door, and he said, why don't you go right down there to the end of that hall and walk in that last door, and Ms. Lillian Smith is your teacher. She's a real sweet lady. And she was, and she became a customer of mine when I had the pharmacy in Loxley many years later. And she and her husband were some of the sweetest and kindest people I ever knew. And then I had a, a, a teacher named Mrs. Vincent Taylor. And uh, I was a cut up in school and I loved to have fun. So one day she was absent from the school room for a few minutes and my friend Tom, uh, Wayne Garrett and I decided we'd put on a show. So they had, they had uh, cloak rooms back then with one end of the room and it had a door on each side. And that's where you would hang your clothes and put your uh, your food when you came to school each day. And so anyway, we decided we'd do a can-can dance. So he would, came out one side doing the can-can dance and I came out the other side doing the can-can dance. And Miss Taylor caught us in that act. And she, she told me, she said, Wendell, you go outside and you get me a switch. And so I went out and I got her a little switch about that long I bought her and I thought that was funny. She didn't think that was funny. She said, you go out and get me a bigger switch. So I went out and I got the one that must have been 10 feet long. I got the biggest bush I could get and bring it in there. Had this class laughing, but it wasn't funny to her. So she, made, she got a yardstick and she said, you go out there and get me six stitches, like switches like this yardstick, and you bring them in to me and I'm gonna wear every one of them out on you if you, go, if you misbehave one more time. <laughs> so needless to say, she got my attention and I was a model student from then on. She was, <laughs> and she turned out to be a wonderful customer of mine in the pharmacy business there. And, and her, uh, her brother Durwood taught me typing at Robertsdale and also taught me accounting in high school. So anyway, that was my grammar school years and I played sports in grammar school, baseball, softball, basketball. 
Went on to Robertsdale, same thing there. Loved baseball, played in the band, started in the band when I was about sixth grade and, and played in that band till graduation time almost. But anyway, the years at Robertsdale was, was a real good time. And during that time, I was working on the farm during the summers, and I, I was trying to make a decision. I'd always liked pharmacy. I'd always liked our local pharmacy, and the sun didn't agree with me and my complexion too well. So one day, my brother had me in a silo pit on the side of a hill, and needless to say, that, that uh, silo, it, it wasn't very pleasant. There were flies, there were gnats, and there was odor. And so I decided that day I was going to do something else. So I came to town to have lunch and I walked in the local pharmacy there and that air conditioner hit me and, I, and at about 12, 14 years old, I decided I'm, I'm going to be a pharmacist. I want to work inside. So I started pursuing that effort and trying to keep my grades up real nice where I'd be, where I could enter pharmacy school. and. So of course I met my wife Sean in 11th grade and that's another story, it's been a wonderful marriage. And then uh, I went off to pharmacy school, I wasn't too happy there for a little while and I decided I'd go to a smaller school on my brother's advice, I went to Mississippi Southern for three years, came back, Sean and I married and, uh, and so I was there two years, we were married and she worked for the math department. The, the head of the math department, Dr. Parker, and she, uh, she just did a wonderful job for them. And of course, then we, I graduated in 50, uh, 57 and came home in 58, rather. And then I worked in the chains in Mobile, Albright and Wood for a year or so. And then I was called in the Army and did that Army effort. And then came back and uh, purchased Loxley, Strauss's rug at the time, and I changed it to Loxley Pharmacy. And we lived in the back of the pharmacy there until one night we was coming home from visiting her parents in Fairhope. And uh, there was a man waiting apparently to rob us because drugs weren't prevalent on the street then, but uh, pharmacists were getting uh, killed around the state and around the world and around America and they're being kidnapped for the uh, controlled drugs that was in the pharmacy because I had two friends that were shot and killed at gunpoint and so anyway when I pulled up behind the pharmacy to go into our pharmacy to go into my apartment where I lived this man had already made his way across the street I saw him behind a tree when I pulled up there about 11:30 at night and so my wife had one foot out the door and I pulled her back in the door and took off and we avoided him. Needless to say, we moved out of there because it was a dangerous situation. And so anyway, we, we worked there for 27 years. I really enjoyed pharmacy. I loved being a pharmacist and consulting with our patients and seeing them grow and get well and seeing their families grow up and, so forth and so on, but Loxley grew from from 700 people that the post office served to 1,000 people in the 27 years that I was there, and I decided to make a career change. And so in the meanwhile, I had bought a Fred store in Loxley, I mean in Robertsdale, and I had sold it, and I had bought a, another drug store in Robertsdale, and I had I sold it and I decided to make a career change because I didn't, I felt like I needed to move in a direction different than what I was going to have a, a satisfactory retirement. I was 55 years of age and so Sean said, what do you think you're going to do? You've been a pharmacist all your life. I said, I don't know, but God has something better than this for me. So I began to research. Uh, what my career wanted to be, and I decided since I had friends that owned McDonald's, I'd do real well in McDonald's if I could own a number of McDonald's. So I went and trained for a year for them with them, and of course they don't pay you anything, and I drove 40 miles each way for a year, and by the end of that year, I didn't see them looking for a pharmacy for me. I mean, not a pharmacy, but a McDonald's. And I went into the self-storage business, 
And that's when things began to happen. I developed Self Storage in Mobile, Pensacola, and Montgomery, and had one of the largest anywhere in Alabama. And God just blessed me with so, so much success in that business. And we had my wife and I helped me night and day, and we had uh, three mobile home parks. We had 20 apartments that I turned into condos, and we had uh, five self-storage businesses that we sold all of them except one, still have one now, and one RV park. And so uh, that's pretty much my story in business, and uh, we've it's been a good trip. God's been good to me. I've been very blessed with a good family, and I thank God for all his blessings, and I look forward to the rest of my life. Thank you.